I'm David Wilson, ISPS member, and I'm the moderator for Dr. Martin Cosgrove, who will be talking about psychopathology in prison and, and the community understanding the developmental implications of trauma and psychosis. Marty knows a great deal about this. He has a PhD from the California School of Professional Psychology in Fresno. Also worked at, at the Atascadero State Hospital in Atascadero, California and subsequently worked for about 20 years at the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo, a prison. Uh, Marty has since retired and is considering what to do with this next phase of his life. So I'll be turning this over to Marty. Thanks, David. Um, first of all, my preference when I talk is, is to not talk at you for the next hour, which is actually kind of nice to have an hour. This works much better for all of us if we have a dialogue. Um, I've got some things prepared. By the way, the handouts are simply a, a means to kind of follow along and hopefully organize some of your notes should you be interested enough to take a few. Uh, so the first question um, I need to know is how many of you either now or have in the past worked in a forensic environment? Got to know who I'm home. Yeah, over half you good. Lots of war stories and we'll get to some of those. Um, so another important place for me to start is, I already know the answer to this, but I gotta ask, how many of you have ever been working with a psychotic person and maybe treatment was going along nicely and then it just kinda gets stuck and it stays stuck? Have you had that experience? Yeah, of course. Hopefully, what we talk about today will give you some ideas about where you might be getting stuck and how to get unstuck. My experience with that is generalist, there's all sorts of reasons why people can get stuck in, in therapy. We all know that. The two most common factors I find are, have to do with layers of affect. Either the patient's layers of affect that they're not aware of, or the clinician's layers of affect. So this talk, you can apply it to your patients, you can apply it to yourself. Hopefully it's applicable. Um, let's see. So. Layers of affect, what am I talking about? Uh, I'm not talking about a seven layer burrito from Taco Bell, although it could be an interesting analogy. Um, there's an infinite number of layers that could be possible, but I, I want you to think about um, some as a precursor to everything else I'm gonna say. Layers, they can be the in utero layer of experience. Now that's something I don't, think anybody here has been taught in school about it. I certainly wasn't. I can tell you from my clinical experience as well as my personal experience, it's extremely relevant. The more you can understand about somebody's in utero experience, the more likely you are to help them break free of something that sometimes decades worth of potentially good clinical work got nowhere fast. So that's one layer. I'm taking these in kind of a, a developmental sequence. Um, obviously birth uh, can be a horrendous layer of experience and affect. Um, again, these are, these are experiences too oftentimes we don't know about as clinicians, we're not taught, and if you haven't stumbled across it in yourself or working with clients or had a chance to read a good book on it, it's just not on your radar screen. And when it's not on your radar screen, there's a good chance that the therapy you provide won't be as nearly as effective as it could which is why I'm here. Uh, basically just human development. You know, the more you understand about their developmental stages, um, certainly to include trauma, the more likely you are to appreciate their layers of affect. Um, past treatment, very often times underexplored in therapy. I can just, while my talk isn't about character disordered folks particularly, it's extremely relevant when you're talking about people that have, you know, you're the 12th therapist. If you don't start by talking about their prior therapy, you're just gonna be another therapist on the heap. And it's a layer of experience and there's lots of affect connected with it. Um, societal events, you know, those, the, the emotions, I'm not currently practicing because I'm kind of temporarily retired and whatnot, but I'm sure that if I was in private practice right now, um, I'd be hearing a lot of people talk about this whole crazy election thing. And they have lots of emotions about that. Understandably, I think, as, as do we all. Um, and it's important to understand how people's emotions, including ours, about what's happening now in society may be triggering layers of old affect. 
It's always going on. The, the more intense the symptoms, the more stuck they are, the more likely it is that there's multiple layers of affect that are activated and are just getting the person um, to where they don't really know what's going on. Uh, let's see, and obviously current life events, and that could be your treatment, could be their living environment, certainly in a prison setting. I mean, anything that's going on in the prison is likely to activate them in their, their past affect. So that's just the kind of framework to help you understand all this. I hope as we go along, um, you take time to think about some of the clients that you've worked with that have been stuck with and see if some of this notion of layers of affect starts to make sense. Um, my experience has been that as I wrestled with stuckness in therapy, inevitably, and it took me years to figure this out, inevitably there were layers that I just had no clue. I was really good at zeroing in on the, the core uh, conflict, trauma, whatever it might be. And it's like, well, you know, if we're dealing with that, how come they're not getting better? They might feel a little better, but they were still pretty well stuck. And that's kind of how I discovered these various layers. Uh, and it's very freeing to understand this and to be able to think about it. Um, okay. So, so, let's start with the first point. But before I move on, any questions or reactions to this notion of layers? Does it make sense? Is it new information, different way of thinking about it? Mindful of the time and we got a lot more information to cover. One thing I didn't say up front that I, I, I wanted to, and so I'll say it now, I've done inpatient work and outpatient work, and my experience is there's not a whole lot of difference between the therapy I do in prison and the therapy I do in my office on the street. Obviously, prison brings, in forensic situations, bring all sorts of kind of environmental issues and medication issues and custody issues and all those kinds of things, and you have to account for those for sure. But generally speaking, when I sit down in my therapist chair in my private practice from the prison, the guys were getting the same thing. And let me tell you a, a trick I found. You know, for those of you that work in uh, forensic settings or with forensic patients, especially if you see them when they're not necessarily voluntary patients, I found a lot of them uh, can be somewhat narcissistic. And they come through that through honest means. But, um, and I, you know, and guys don't really want to engage in therapy. And I say, yeah, you don't have to. I say, but look, guess what? We, you're in the system, you're on my case, I gotta see you. So look, the state's willing, you know, I, I said, tell guys, I charge 120 bucks an hour in my, uh, in my practice. You get it for free. And you see this, whoa, I'm gonna get this for free? And it's an interesting little hook. I found a number of guys over the years that would otherwise just stay defended that take, go ahead and take advantage of it. So if you work in that setting, you might wanna give that a try if you're finding it hard to get somebody to participate. Okay, uh, this next point, early trauma often leads to diminished trust and thus heightened ambivalence. Uh, that goes without saying, um, but it's important to say. Trauma interferes with safety, which interferes with the development of conscience. Now, a lot of people have read in textbooks or seen it on TV or whatever that psychopaths don't have a conscience and can't develop one. That's just not true. It's absolutely not true. Okay. How do I know that? Well, I've been doing this work for a long time. I also developed for my uh, dissertation an instrument to measure superego. And you can measure it and it does things in predict, if you understand superego development, it, it, it measures out in predictable ways. Um, so, what's involved in the development of conscious? The very first thing is safety. The, I'm, I'm assuming that in this room there aren't psychopaths. You know, none of you look particularly psychopathic. Um, the reason people that are, and I hate the word normal, the reason people that, everyday people that aren't psychopaths do what they do is because, and, and play by the rules, generally speaking, because we don't lose the love and the goodness and support and all those good things we've learned to, to trust and, and rely on from others in, in the world. If you've never had that level of safety and support and nourishment, you have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose. And I can tell you, working in the prison system, I said that to a number of guys over the years, and it's interesting how that one statement can really change their perspective. These are guys that got used to, you know, 
breaking the laws. You know, be that assaulting people, stealing things, you know, selling drugs, doing whatever. And it was just a fact of life for them. Although, generally speaking, they don't really like to do it. It's stressful. It's not a good way to go through life. But when you talk to them about the fact that they had nothing to lose early in life, ooh, thing goes off in their head. And then now they get it. They had, there, there was no reason to play the game because the game was never in their favor. And if the game's not in their favor, why bother? So when it comes to providing treatment, especially in a prison system, the game, the therapy game, has to be in their favor. And if you don't find a way to help them see that, you may not get to first base with these clients. Um, heightened ambivalence. Let me give you a quick um, case from my private practice. I saw this gal, I'll call her Sherry. Um, I saw her for a number of years and she did very well. Um, Sherry was a second born. Um, it was because mom needed an emergency C-section with a first born. It was a planned C-section. So, and very much wanted, planned, everything was all good. She got eight months and 29 days of bliss. I mean, really, a wonderful mother, wonderful family. Delivery day shows up. They, you know, prep mom, do all the stuff, uh, give her whatever anesthesia, number up. Surgeon grabs the scalpel, and uh, apparently they didn't give her enough or her body, whatever, wasn't quite numb yet. Now, can you imagine, you don't have to be a woman to imagine this, can you imagine being ready to deliver a cherished and loved child and going from bliss to the trauma of all that pain being cut open with a scalpel, okay? So her, her struggle, my client Sherry's struggle was she experienced love and then all of a sudden there was this that kind of trauma feels like hate so or pain. So she had totally inverted love and hate or love and pain. For her, her relationships were terrible because she ended up seeking out hurtful situations. Not physically, I mean she wasn't abused, but hurtful situations because that's what she knew love was in that moment. Had she been developed or uh, develop, um, delivered normally without those kind of complications, uh, she'd have been fine. Her brother was fine. And we took years to understand how that one experience changed everything about who she was and how good got misinterpreted as bad all the time in every facet of her life. And it took us years to untangle that. And everything, because it happened literally on her birthday, it affected every aspect of her personality. So every time she'd be doing really good and then, you know, therapy I think it was kind of like this slow downward corkscrew and you get deeper and deeper and you kind of revisit issues at a deeper level. And she'd do really well for a while, was nice and stable, and then come back around to this birth trauma and just feel like we were getting nowhere. And it, it took a few of these uh, downward spiral passes and cycles to help her appreciate that for the very foreseeable future, she was going to have to be mindful of anything that triggered that layer of affect. Now that's overwhelming. That's overwhelming. And this somebody, because when you're, the day you're born, you don't have language, she's the one that taught me about how you've really got to pay attention to the body. So where do you feel it in your body? And she could do that and talk about the tension. Um, and she learned to trust that and she learned to not stay silent when she would get anxious when something was starting to trigger this layer of affect. And we, I, I, I didn't count them, but if, if I were to, oh, there'd probably be at least a couple dozen layers for her. Various components of her life that got connected with this birth trauma. Um, by now she's got a master's degree and is probably very effective in the uh, clinical environment that she works in. Um, let's see. Um, so early trauma affects trust, we know that. One of the ways I help guys in prison who aren't the warmest and fuzziest group typically um, start to appreciate this stuff, and I would ask them, 
appreciate the issues about trust is who do you trust the most in life? Or who do you, I think you say, who do you trust completely? Inevitably, and this was usually in a group situation, and inevitably, you know, somebody would say, mom. I said, really? No, you don't. And they get a little bit offended because I'm dissing on their mom. Um, I said, let me point it out to you. I said, if you needed heart surgery, would you have your mother do it? I said, well, no. Well, you just said you trust her completely. I said, well, no, not with that. Like, right. Trust is always specific to whatever the circumstances. There's emotional trust. There's physical trust. You know, I said, you, you probably trust me not to hurt you while you're in this group, but because I work for the state, you may otherwise not trust me. And it's interesting. Starting to um, parcel out the various kinds of trust help them start to even think about trust. This is not something they feel in their bones or they've ever thought about, but it's a way to start to, for them to wrap their head around it. Who do I trust? Why? Why don't I? It breaks it down and makes it more manageable. Um, let's see. Trusting yourself obviously is essential. It's a real big problem. If you've experienced very early trauma in life, why would you want to be yourself? If you don't want to be yourself, how can you trust yourself? And I'll say it to people just like that. I've said, my experience working in prison, sometimes being, and I can be this way anyway, but being a little sarcastic and flippant um, gets through where if you're nice and proper and nice and neat, it may just get brushed off. And so sometimes if guys tell me about some of their struggles, I'll say, eh, it sucked being you. And they kind of get that, you know? They, they may not be ready for a, a warmer, gentler, more subtle, effective approach, but just saying it kind of sucked being you in a very broad brush stroke way gets it for them. And it's a great place to start. Obviously as time goes on you want to refine that, but broad brush strokes is a great place to start. Um, along with issues of trust come um, and trusting yourself, low self-esteem. Low self or self-esteem requires a self. Again, if you've never wanted to be you because it sucked being you, that's where you got to start as a therapist. You know, it's very important. Um, I could do a whole topic on this next statement I'm about to make, but very often times when there's overwhelming trauma, especially early in life, you know, we have all of us have these categories where we file experience. Certainly, is how how we relate to it. And oftentimes, as an infant, you file that experience in the not me. That's just not me. Well. If you put all of you in the not me category, that doesn't leave a lot left to engage reality. That's why um, fragile, psychotic people struggle so much is because they've probably parked a lot of themselves in that not me category. So when you're empathizing with somebody and talking and months and months go by and it feels like you're just, they're not there, you may wonder to yourself, I wonder if they're in the not me. A classic example of this, I was at the state hospital and there's a guy who had been on the, the ward longer than I had, very psychotic. The only thing, we had a very sophisticated psychiatrist, very psychotherapy oriented. Um, the only thing he could tell me about this guy was when the more stressed he is, the further down he pulls his hat over his face. And we're talking about a man that's got years and years and years of experience and a very capable therapist. I pulled this guy into a therapy group and uh, um, coping with schizophrenia group I used to do. And because he was so fragile, I just let him sit for several months actually. Um, I would check in with him but didn't make a big deal when he you know, just kind of nodded or whatever because he needed to just slowly get comfortable with the room. And I finally got tired of that. And it just seemed like when I would ask him you know, how things going today, he would just, like he wasn't there. And so I asked him one time, I said, Jerry, where are you? He said, I'm not here. What do you mean you're not here? I'm not here. So Jerry would be sitting here and he experienced himself. Talk about not me. If he was sitting there, he experienced himself in the opposite corner of the room, up in the corner. Now that's in that physical location, that's about as not me as you can get. It's like, oh, I get it. You're, you're not you. At that point, I pulled him into individual therapy and we started getting into all the reasons why that was. But when somebody's been traumatized, that's oftentimes a category that they file themselves in and they're experiencing. And you can go on for decades and get nowhere fast 
if you're not aware to look in that file. Uh, let's see. Um, when it comes to early trauma, and, uh, I'll just say uh, for those of you that work in forensic settings, um, sexual abuse among male prisoners, and I don't mean getting raped in prison, that certainly occurs, but it's, it's much, much, much higher. I would, my, and it's just a guess, I'm guessing at least 30 to 40 percent of male prisoners have been sexually abused at an early age, if not a lot higher. Um, I would keep that in mind. Well, if you're working with that population. Uh, okay. So, um, that third point, trust and safety, is a foundation of developing a conscious. We kind of talked about that. Uh, one of the things I think as therapists we tend to ignore slash take for granted is vulnerability. Particularly in forensic settings, these are guys that are horribly vulnerable. I mean, a lot of prisons, you can get stabbed by a best friend on any given day. I had a guy that had come from a very hardcore prison, very gang-controlled prison, um, and literally he was walking across the, the prison yard with his best buddy from like age five. Guy's got his arm around him, they get halfway across the yard, and his best buddy from the streets literally stabs him in the back. So talk about vulnerable. So we're vulnerable when we're abused. You're vulnerable in prison just because you're there. You're vulnerable because you're sitting in front of a therapist that wants to get inside your head. And while you may th accept that that's probably a good idea, it doesn't make it any less vulnerable feeling for you. And I think it's important to talk about that. You know, too often as therapists we kind of uh, just assume patients should just trust us. Why shouldn't they trust us? I mean, we're like well, we're there on their side. There's nothing oftentimes in their experience that suggests they should trust you. And it's kind of arrogant on our part to just run right past that. You know, if I'm going to have heart surgery, I don't want to go into the cardiologist, you know, two weeks at that last appointment before the surgery and have the guy say, ah, just trust me, it'll be fine. No, I want you to tell me what you're going to do. How long am I going to be incapacitated after the surgery, you know. I, I, explain it for me. Um, and I think we need to do the same thing with the people that we work with. Um, by the way, when you're dealing with paranoia, explanations, and then we're going to get to that here in a minute, go a long, long, long way. These are, by definition, people that aren't very trusting. They've got good reason not to trust. They've been traumatized by so many people so consistently that they've got good reason from their frame of reference to not trust you. And to run right past that is rude. It's absolutely rude. Uh, let me see. So, a couple, you know, as always, this, we end up using up more time than I predict. Um, let me tell you about a wonderful case briefly of somebody developing a uh, conscious. At the state hospital I had a guy show up on the unit, uh, very angry, paranoid. He was there for murder and mayhem. He had killed somebody and absolutely maimed uh, the guy's roommate. Uh, was pretty frightening. He wasn't a very tall guy. He was only about 5'8". Uh, um, just to put it bluntly, he was very ugly, smelled a lot, long, scraggly hair, just your classic stay away from me kind of presentation. I'm guessing if you've worked with this population for any of the time, you've run across people like that. And the bottom line is he made everybody, he made the staff uncomfortable, he made the patients uncomfortable. He was an obnoxious person and I realized he was making this, the unit so uncomfortable that you know, it was going to have to be me that helped deal with this guy because nobody else wanted to deal with him. So I pulled him into individual therapy, started seeing weekly. One of the most paranoid people I've ever worked with. Um, and we talked for a while and you know the trust starts to develop and we get into, start to get into all these layers. This guy was sexually abused by both parents. They would lock him in closets, make him watch him have sex. It goes on and on and on. Okay, but once we started to talk about that and these early traumas and what it meant interpersonally, because we talked about that as well, started to come out, he started to relax. So this guy went from being the nightmare on the unit to the guy who was the go-to guy. You know, once he kind of turned the corner, he started being helpful. He was a guy that had spent a lot of time in prison and group homes, so he knew how to handle the guys on the unit. And if somebody was jacked up, a lot of times before the staff would get to him, he would kind of intervene 
in, in sophisticated ways beyond what the, the typical staff member could do. But basically, we, we made it safe uh, between he and I where he could start to trust his experience himself. And my experience is once, once people really feel that, um, that they can trust themselves, the rest takes off. There was a question, comment? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, at that phase in my clinical development, I was beginning to get more sophisticated in how, um, I was fairly early on in my career, uh, and it was um, just beginning to appreciate how people dealt with stuff in their body. So, and I know the kind of standard stuff, you don't touch patients, but this guy was clearly out of touch with his body. And we sat, my office was very small, and he, our knees, when we were sitting comfortably, were probably no more than four feet apart, which in a forensic setting is pretty darn close. And one time I could tell he was kind of starting to flee a little bit from our experience in the room, and I reached over and uh, touched him on his knee. <laughs> I learned there's a reason why they have rules. And I said, why did you do that? But you know what, he trusted, I, I, I knew that we had had some kind of trust and it wasn't totally a risky thing. But he asked me, which meant he trusted me enough, he didn't just react. And I would never touch somebody, I didn't do it again after that, I learned. But it still served the purpose. So my next step with him was, okay, I get it touching, that's kind of weird. And literally all I did was touch his knee. And I, it, it, it didn't come out of the blue, I don't remember, it was years and years ago, back, it was back in the early 90s. Um, so I figured, well, if we can't do that, let's try Frisbee. So one time I went out on a break with him, and I arranged this ahead of time, and I grabbed a Frisbee, one of, one of the RTs, and I just, I, I can play Frisbee. And I gently tossed it to him, and he went, he was so out of touch with his body that he could not respond to an object f from another human being. And this is a guy that as a kid had done karate, so he clearly had the skills. It was the interpersonalness. It's like, wow, he's still very terrified of the physical bodily reality of a relationship. And that told me, wow, we have got to go down into low gear and stay there for quite a while. Um, let's see. Uh, let me tell you another story. War stories are good, but they're also instructive. Uh, there's a guy when I worked at the prison who was actually a bank robber. Kind of paranoid. Not in the classic bouncing off the walls, paranoid skits kind of way, more of a sarcastic, I get depressed, paranoid because the world's not a safe place kind of a thing. And what was interesting, and we had slowly developed some rapport, but nothing really significant. Um, and he was pretty good at not answering questions. Um, he was one of those guys that we were doing therapy extra light. It was keeping him in there, but we weren't getting very far. And at one point he made a, he did have a great sense of humor, and at one point he, we were talking a little bit about his skepticism, and he said it's something along the lines of it's, it's all about Howard and Sammy. I said, what? Howard and Sammy? And we were talking about his paranoid reaction in relationship to his robbing a bank and stuff. And so I thought Sammy was probably Uncle Sam, and I checked that out. I was, well, so I get who Sammy is. Who's, who's Howard? He said, you know, Howard. Howard be that name. <laughs> it's, it, and I did the same thing. I laughed. But you know what? In that little snippet, he told me the extent of his paranoid stuff. And, and as soon as we got to that, the next week we started getting into how controlling mom was because now I knew symbolically where his head was at, um, that the government uh, and religion was all kind of against him. And of course that just reflected uh, mom and, and the struggles that they had. And it's not about you know beating up on moms. The reality is most of us spend our early de developmental years with mom and if there's problems in that relationship, they just end up surfacing down the road. Um, okay, we're running quickly out of time. I've got to get to this one point, um, which I alluded to earlier, and that is educating uh, clients. Um, I'm actually working on a paper with a, a friend over in Denmark um, about psychoeducation, and that, that means different things to different people, but for me what it means is teaching people about the process of therapy. Okay, when you're a white middle class guy dealing with somebody that's black from the, the uh, gang infested parts of South Central LA, there's not going to be a whole lot of trust there in the beginning. You represent everything that they've learned to not trust. And for good reason, by the way, as you probably understand. 
I explain to them, and I, as I do in my private practice, that therapy is the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life if you choose to do it. And you know, that already validates something they kind of know intrinsically. So telling them that up front means you don't have to just trust me. It makes sense to you what you're embarking on. So I'm validating the reality. That's important. Uh, I say sometimes you're going to leave this office, you're going to feel better, sometimes you're going to feel worse. Again, that's reality. I'm not telling them something they probably don't already know, but you know what? If you don't say that, especially if it's somebody that's paranoid, if they leave your office and they have one of those sessions where they end up going home feeling worse, it gets really hard to trust you. Whereas if you've explained it to them up front, they've got a, a way cognitively to wrap around their head around this negative experience they just had. And it's important. I can tell you, I've, I've kept a number of therapy processes going because I made that explanation early on. Um, certainly telling people that there's going to be sometimes two steps forward, one step back, all those kinds of things help people stay engaged. And the more paranoid they, these people are, the more likely those kinds of explanations are to be beneficial. Okay? I'm aware we're down to just a few more minutes. Um, and we haven't gotten to nearly as many things as I wanted to. Um, other questions? 